everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. This is a rather different bump in the road. I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, a tourist destination at 7,200 feet at the foot of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Here, COVID is more than a bump in the road for the many artisans, restaurants, and shops that depend on tourism for a living. Many of them are just hanging on by a thread, and there is no way to know if that proverbial light at the end of the tunnel is an oncoming train or perhaps some economic hope. This episode looks at the New Mexico restaurant industry and the impact that COVID has had. First, I speak with Carol White from the New Mexico Restaurant Association to get a statewide overview of the crisis. Then, in part two, Janice Argabright and Wayne Moore join me to share their experiences as restaurateurs. Janice is part of a New Mexico legacy, the Al Barn Cafe, which was founded by her grandfather. Wayne works for Les Combes Vineyards, which traces its roots back several generations to a wine operation in France. They currently farm a 400-acre vineyard near Deming, New Mexico. Have a tissue handy. This is a tough interview. Carol, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on today. If you would, give us a little bit of perspective on what's been happening in New Mexico and specifically in the New Mexican restaurant industry vis-a-vis COVID-19. So it's interesting, you know, obviously we were shut down in March and um, lived to, through that. We were <laughs> reopened in um, on June 1st, and then we were shut down again on July 13th. And so we are one of three states in the nation that are shut down uh, for indoor dining in, you know, and uh, the other two are New York, excuse me, New Jersey and California. So um, that's that's where we are today, and you know, there's there's a lot of hopelessness in the industry. Talk about that a little bit. I I know I've been talking to restaurateurs, um, small shop owners, and there is just a terrible sense of despair. Everybody's distraught. They don't know what's happening. What's going on with restaurateurs? Well, we're just not getting any signals from the governor that she's going to be opening us up anytime soon. And um, I, I think that does create a lot of despair when people don't know how to plan their lives. You know, obviously, you, you know, what we were trying to do in the first place is that we were, we were being good citizens um, and the goal was to flatten the curve. Um, that was the first goal. We flattened the curve, um, and and then we uh, and then we're just keep we keep being given different goals. So, and the governor keeps making up things. You know, we 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 reach all of her gating criteria, and then she adds another gating criteria, and we you know so we're again the despair and the the helplessness is is just rampant right now nobody knows where we're going with this and obviously you know we we know that covid is a a very concerning virus and we've got to be very careful about how we handle things restaurants have been in the forefront of doing all of the right things you know for one thing um we all have food safety training and we've got to have that in new mexico in order to um, in order to have a restaurant, you have to have somebody on site that has food, food safety training. All of our employees have food handler cards, so they're they're um, versed in sanitation and disinfection and things like that to keep our our customers and our employees safe. So you know, you, and then you layer on. Now we've got COVID safe practices that we have been layering into what we do. And as a matter of fact, I was on a, a webinar the other day with the CDC, and they said, you know, you don't necessarily have to do all of the things that this CDC says, but as many layers as you can put on of, you know, mask wearing and social distancing and, you know, things like that, that, that are those COVID safe practices, the more layers you can put on, the more um, 
safe the general public and your your employees will be. So, you know, so that's something we've been doing and we've been doing it for years and years. And now we have a few more layers of those things. It's not hard for restaurants to do that. We can do that. Um, and, and we have been doing that. So we don't understand why our governor would be one of, uh, you know, 47 other governors have figured out how to open up restaurants and New Mexico can't quite figure that out. There's a sense in the restaurant industry that it's been singled out in a way. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. Without explanation, she singled us out, which we have a lawsuit right now um, that's going to be coming up in the Supreme Court next week. And that that lawsuit basically says that the governor is being arbitrary and capricious in her choices. Um, you know, and, and that goes all the way down to the retail sector as well. You know, I mean, she, um, with, uh, you know, opening up the big box stores and not allowing small stores to open, even with different capacities, you know, those kind of things just show that it was, it was completely arbitrary. There's, there's really no science behind it. Um, we have been asking for the data and the science behind her decisions since she started making the decisions, and they will not share that. And that means that there's something there's something wrong there if you if you're not willing to share the science with the people who are being affected by it. You know, it's not just the restaurant industry either. I mean, all the suppliers are impacted too. Oh, you know, um, one of my biggest heartfelt moments um, was when one of my board members um, called me up and said, I've lost my job. And he's, he's in the supplier business, you know, and he's been there for, I think, 15 years. And, you know, obviously the other heartfelt moments were when I was listening to restaurateurs talk about the hundreds of people they had to lay off. I mean, that, Obviously, you know, 35,000 employees that are not working right now and and possibly not going to have jobs to go back to if we don't get open very soon. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's across the spectrum. It's not just restaurants. It's the whole food service industry in New Mexico. Now, um, I'm in Santa Fe, which is um, a, a bit of an island relative to a lot of New Mexico, but we're almost entirely dependent on tourism. What do you hear from the New Mexico restaurants up here in Santa Fe, where the tours are gone, the locals may or may not be eating out, and nobody knows what the future holds? Well, I have to say, I think your mayor is being brilliant because he's really proactively dealing with this. He's um, he he figured out early on that you guys are dependent on on tourism and therefore he's going to um, make sure and cut back on services from the city just because he's not going to be able to pay for it if he doesn't have the money from tourism. And, um, you know, I'll remind people that um, in New Mexico, our gross receipts tax is um, charged on restaurant meals, but it is not charged on on uh, groceries. And so, so places like Santa Fe that are dependent on tourism, you know, you've got a lot of people eating at grocery stores, but you don't have any gross receipts tax coming in because, because that, those are exempt from, from gross receipts. You know, restaurants are a really low margin business. Um, as a matter of fact, I've heard numbers that it's about a 5% margin business, which really stunned me. Um, one, what are the margins and how do, how does a restaurant managed to weather months, month after month of being closed, I mean, from a financial perspective? You know, I, I mean, I think s s some restaurants are, I, they're hanging by a thread. They've used up all their savings. Um, they've used up all of their payroll protection loans. They may have an idle loan or some other loan out there, but but they're having to pay those back on a you know regular basis, and they don't have the money to do that. You know, I thought it was interesting that the um, the governor and the and the state came up with these loans um, from the 
finance authority <laughs> and and it's over a hundred million dollar in dollars in loans but the loans are um four-year loans at a very low interest rate but you've got to pay them back in four years and we don't we don't really expect to be out of this as far as restaurants go in the next four years and just to just to reiterate what you said about the margins in restaurants you know a restaurant's doing really well if it can if it can bottom line 10 percent and that's you know before taxes um, a restaurant, most restaurants in New Mexico are probably making around 5%. That means, and, and the other thing about this is, and you got to think about this, is that 95% of those sales go back into the community through payroll, through suppliers, through other things. So, the, you know, and then if there's 5% left in those lo lo local restaurants, that restaurateur is living there in the community and putting it back into the community. So um, it's not, you know, it's not a big money making venture. I don't, if, if anybody gets in <laughs> into the restaurant industry to make money, um, good luck. But, um, you know, they say it, uh, there's an old joke, you know, how do you make a million dollars in a restaurant? And the uh, answer to that is you start with two. Um, and you may end up with one, but more likely you end up with nothing. And right now, I think there's so many restaurants, you know, one of the, the webinars we're going to do upcoming is um, how to file for bankruptcy and save your restaurant. And that's just, that is heartbreaking that we would have to have those kind of webinars for our members. You know, um, we've done a lot to help them get their PPP loans, to help them, you know, navigate the Small Business Administration and some of the the um, CARES Act and and the FFCRA Act and things like that. So, um, you know, it's just a it's a crazy time right now for restaurants, and I can't even imagine having to make the decisions they're making. How does one navigate bankruptcy as a restaurant? I'm not a lawyer. Um, and I think part of it is, you know, uh, deciding which kind of bankruptcy, you know, do you do you file for Chapter 7, Chapter 11? And honestly, I don't even know too much about that. What we do when we do webinars for folks is we'll bring in um, a lawyer that is a bankruptcy lawyer and uh, an expert on that, so, you know, and, and give them that expert advice. Yeah, because it, it seems to me, even if you could go through bankruptcy, save some of your assets with the idea you might be able to open again in the future. And again, I'm not a lawyer either. It's still, there's so much chance and risk right now in not knowing what the future holds. Um, how does one try to make plans to say, I'll reopen in a year or 18 months? Is that even doable? So I'm I'm kind of likening it to... Um, opening a brand new restaurant. So when you open a restaurant, usually you have some capital behind you that you that you live on because it's hard to get your controls underfoot in the first two or three years. Um, so you're you have some extra capital from whatever loans you took out or from your life savings that you saved uh, to open up a restaurant, um, but. Right now, I, th that's my fear, is that these folks don't have that, um, that, that reserve, that financial case. Back up, yeah. the reserve, the, right, right, the, the, yeah. So they don't have that to continue. So they're almost like opening up a new restaurant without any reserves. And, you know, I mean, again, there's a saying in the restaurant industry, you know, for every five restaurants that open, uh, four will close in the first five years. Yep. And so I think we've got that to, and I, I don't want to say look forward to, but I think that's what we're going to be looking now, at. Now, some restaurants are very innovative and they're pivoting into different business models. Have you seen any that, business models that kind of catch your eye? And where do you think that this will lead in terms of the future of the local restaurant industry? So I've heard from a lot of restaurants that are like, why didn't I put in a drive through window, right? Um, that's just like, uh, because the restaurants that have drive throughs are doing fairly well right now. Um, 
you know, that's where people feel safe going out to eat. And that's where the governor has lo- allowed us to, to uh, be open. And, and, just the convenience of having a drive-through rather than having to stop and take out from someplace is interesting. I a uh, couple of restaurants have put in drive-through windows. Number one, number two, um, I have heard of of some rural restaurants that have put in small grocery areas in their restaurant, and they're doing very well. As a matter of fact, I talked to one in Tucumcari um, a couple of weeks ago, and she said, "She said, Carol, we will never." not do groceries again. She said that this is a part of what we will continue to do. Because in those rural areas, I mean, think about it, they don't have a lot of grocery capability. Number one, number two, um, you know, for a while there, they couldn't get toilet paper in grocery stores, but we had uh, suppliers that supplied restaurants that did have grocery, uh, did have toilet paper. So, um, so we were able to get toilet paper when grocery stores were not. And, and same with disinfecting. I mean, we have warehouses full of disinfecting solutions, et cetera. They're in, they're in gallon bottles. Um, they're in restaurant packs, but um, people, that's really what people were looking for is, is, you know, just give me the, give me the way to disinfect my home. And so, um, so I, I think that's another way people have pivoted is having small grocery stores, grocery capabilities. And then you think about, wait, one, one other thing there are, especially in New Mexico, we have, uh, what they call, uh, food deserts. And what that is, is where a place where you really can't get fresh food. You can't get fresh produce anywhere. You know, the closest place to you might be a convenience store and they might have some lemons and limes and a few other things, but they're not going to have a big grocery section with fresh produce. Um, and you know, so all the grocery stores have gone out of business. There's one Walmart, but it's, you know, 50 miles away. Um, and so I think restaurants are seeing that they're more rural, they're more spread out and they can be this kind of grocery, um, fresh produce place for people in their communities. And what about fine dining? Where is that going to go? So I was asked the other day um, something along these lines. And and if you think about it, I mean, fine dining is the one that's really suffering right now because they can't do indoor dining. They, you know, the thought of bringing home a $32 steak and eating it from a cardboard and or um, foam <laughs> uh, box just that's hard one. So a lot of them have shut down. A lot of them are are trying to wait this out rather than rather than try to bend over backwards and be something different than they are. So um, again, though, you know, they've got bills that are going ongoing. And this is the problem is that they've got um, their overhead, uh, you know, utilities, rent, um, other costs that you know, insurance, other things that don't stop. Even if they close their doors, those things don't stop. And therefore, they've got to have some kind of income coming in or they've got to have deep pockets. You know, I I don't think any of us know how this is going to evolve. But what I'd love to do is in a year or so, regroup, get together again, and talk a little bit about how far we've come, hopefully in a really good way, and where things are going again, because I think this will have a long-term impact on how we view restaurants, how restaurants view uh, um, their customers. I I think this is a game changer uh, for an American public that spends a lot of money eating out. I do too. And, and, and if you think about it um, last February, uh, restaurants were 50% of the food dollar. So, People were spending about half of their money in restaurants and half at grocery stores. Obviously, that's changed. I don't have the the exact numbers, but it's significantly less. It took us a long time to get to that point, um, you know, where people were spending that much money in, in 
restaurants. And so we'll see, you know, we'll see where the new uh, frontier takes us. But I think there's going to be a lot of pent up demand. I think people are really going to want to eat in um, restaurants when this all is over. Um, and who knows when that will be. Um, hopefully the pent up demand will bring back restaurants in a way that, in a way that they were prior to, to this um, virus. I, I think over. we all miss our local restaurants. We miss getting together. We miss socializing. Uh, we, we, we miss it all. Um, and I think that uh, when everything reopens, we should all make it a point to put out dining out first on our must-do list. Well, I certainly hope so. And I think travel is going to be one of those things as well. I mean, you know, um, I, I think it's very hard, at least for me, not to go somewhere, right? I really want to travel. And and honestly, my, my husband and I have been getting out in New Mexico a lot. Um, but, you know, um, we have kids spread out across the country and we're really dying to go see them and and be with them. So... Um, and I think other people feel that way. And, and obviously in Santa Fe, you know, you guys uh, do rely on tourism and tourists. I actually was going to bring a big group to Santa Fe this uh, this summer. And uh, we have plans to bring it, ne the group, next summer. So fingers crossed we're all over this and, and we can get back to some of the travel that we've been been used to doing over the last few years here here to, to travel to restaurants and to having fun again yes absolutely thank you for joining us today i hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life path because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life Bump in the Road is a production of Cancer Road Trip. Subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media at Cancer Road Trip, and you can learn more at www.cancerroadtrip.com. Until next time, be safe and be well.